Welcome, tea friends. This is Barb Gully from Barb's Tea Service, and we are back with our 16th podcast. Sweet 16. Here we are. Here we are. So we we made it through our our learner's permit. We can throw that away. Yeah, yeah. We're, we've got the license to podcast. <laughs> yes. They grow up so fast. <laughs> but I think I'm going to keep that learning permit because we're still learning. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Okay. okay. All, right. All right. So I am here with studio engineer, Arm Candy co-host, Chris Gully. Hi, here I Chris. Am. Here I am in the flesh. Yes, you are. All right. Hey, great way to be. So today we are going to be talking about Vermont. Vermont? Vermont. What? <laughs> so last week we talked about Mount Royal. Uh-huh. Montreal. Right. Today we're going to talk about Verdmont. Uh-huh. Or Vermont. Uh Uh-huh. And this was really fun to experience last month. This was the first time for both of us to go to Vermont. It was. And we got to see a lot of fun places, including a presidential home and a few very Vermont, Vermont stores. It was (laughs) Vermontish. It was. And if we have time, and I hope we do, we're going to talk about some of the origins of one of my favorite teas, which is Earl Grey. Uh Uh-huh. But first, tea. Here we go. Okay, so today's tea is from a tea room that we visited in Hudson, New York. Mm -hmm. And that's going to foreshadow an upcoming podcast all about that charming space in in New York. Right. Uh, Hudson Valley. Hudson Valley, yeah. Hudson Valley, right. So we stopped at a place called Verdigree Tea Room. Is it Verdigree or Verdigris? Ooh. Huh? Huh? I think it depends on what what side of Ferndale you're from. <laughs> like, okay. Yes. All right. So here is the tea. Uh huh. Is that showing up? Mm-hmm. So this is an interesting twist. This is Russian Earl Grey. Uh huh. So this is uh, their version with, a, like I said, a slight twist. Uh-huh. So take a taste and and let me. Okay. Okay. Know how you like. Oh, that's um, it's it's a it's a lighter version Definitely. of Earl Grey and mm-hmm. some more. Uh, um, uh, even without consulting my my taste, will there's uh, a lot of more citrusy than the typical bergamot. It 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 is. It yeah. has a bit of lemon ah, okay. in it, a little bit of orange peel, uh-huh. and there's lemongrass in yeah. it. I it's, said that it's very drinkable. Yeah. Uh, yes, and it is, and it's it's. Uh, we're serving it hot today, mm-hmm. but right. so they say on the label it makes a great iced tea, which I can imagine yes. it would. Mm-hmm. And I just want to show the mugs that we're using today. Yes. So my mug comes from Plymouth Notch, uh-huh. the birthplace of Calvin Coolidge. Uh-huh. Got this nice yep. mug there. And you are? Yep. Uh, this is uh, the Harding House mug. Yes. So I guess we should be uh, grateful that uh, this tea does not take taste like dead presidents because <laughs> that's not on my taste. No, that's, that is not. Okay. But it's kind of nice because we're keeping in the same time period yes. and there's that connection. Mm-hmm. Right. So, okay. So let's I'm gonna take another sip of that. All I, right. I did enjoy that. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about our journey to Vermont mm-hmm. via Montreal. So we came back from Montreal through the Vermont border. Right. Uh, first, a few facts about Vermont. Yes. So, in 1609, we have Samuel de Champlain uh-huh. coming from France, uh-huh. one of the first European surveyors of this land. Right. And he comes up to Lake Champlain. Uh-huh. He <laughs> says, that's odd. That's my name. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess it's one of those benefits yes. of being an explorer. You can yep. name things that you like that's right. after yourself. All okay. Right. Excellent. So... In the mid 1600s, he makes a map of mm-hmm. this and he charts out this this area, uh-huh. calling it Verdmont, uh, which means Green Mountain. Uh, it's like the Green Mountain Boys. Yeah, <laughs> it's a band. It's a band. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan of. I think that might be country music. Yeah. Okay, uh-huh. so Vermont became part of New France mm-hmm. until. 1765. Uh, there's a little uh, tiff between the, I think this is the French and Indian War. Yes. Uh, and um, the French and the Indians kind of lost. They they did. Yep. 
And so the English got it yes. for a bit of time. Right. But then yada, 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 yeah. War of Independence. Yeah, things and <laughs> Then Vermont became a state, uh -huh. a 14th state in right. 1791. Right after the original 13. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then what surprised me as mm -hmm. we were going, because again, this was our, our both of our first trip to Vermont, mm -hmm. is that there's not a lot of people here. There were not. It's uh, like, uh, it, it's just, it's one huge giant postcard. The entire, <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> entire state. That's a great way to describe it. Yes. It is. It's, it's just beautiful. Yes. So the census, the 2020 census, puts them at 640,000. Yes. That's uh, not a lot of people that, for a fairly large area. Right. It is actually the least populated state uh -huh. except for Wyoming. Which is a, a larger state. Who, right. Who knew? <laughs> I, I didn't, but I became very aware as we were driving yes, through. Right. So it's a six small state in area. Uh -huh. And the capital is? Montpelier, Correct. which is... Which is a, a trivia answer uh, for what's the capital of Vermont? Oh, I thought you were going to tell us maybe it was Pillier Mountain, but it... <laughs> no. Okay. No. no okay. No. Well, good. That's that is good. We'll keep no. that in our back pocket That's as right. a state capital. No. But it's not the biggest state. The uh -huh. biggest state is Burlington. Uh huh. And in the 1980s, somebody very famous was mayor. Yes, uh, he's the current uh, United States senator from uh, Vermont, uh, one Bernie Sanders. Exactly. Okay. So back to the population, though, just to, for some comparison, mm -hmm. in the 2020 census, right. Detroit was at 630,000. Right. Yeah. So, so. Yep. And it doesn't look anything like Vermont. <laughs> it does not. It does not. Yeah. But that does explain, as you said, it, it, this is a postcard yeah. mm -hmm. state. Right. And, and as we were driving around, there weren't a lot of stops or no. exits that you could go to no. not a lot of those large yeah it's a different travel yeah travel by car experience than we're typically i mean we're uh you know necessarily we we drive you know interstates most of the time right to get right. anywhere fairly quickly and that's a whole uh, overused term that's a di whole different vibe driving <laughs> vibe in uh in vermont it's it's just uh one big country road <laughs> that's right i know because i kept looking for like oh an off yeah, exit yeah. where we could go to mcdonald's yeah. or um that, that doesn't staying classy it doesn't happen nope. <laughs> no there's no buckies no so no. okay but we noticed this as we went to all our different sites right. so we went to plymouth notch uh -huh. birthplace of calvin coolidge it is we went to the vermont country store uh -huh. love that yes we went to the vermont teddy bear store uh-huh and then we went to hildeen right which is the home of uh, a Robert Todd Lincoln. Yeah, he was the son of the only surviving child, actually, of, of Abraham Lincoln and right. Mary Todd. Amazing. Yes. So there's a lot to talk about. We probably won't get to everything, right. but uh, but anyway, we'll start in order mm -hmm. of Plymouth Notch. Right. And Plymouth Notch is the childhood home of Calvin Coolidge. It is. And you asked me the other day, was Calvin Coolidge a tea drinker? Yes, because we have to have some. <laughs> <laughs> Some connection with this podcast. Do we? <laughs> <I don't. laughs> we kind of go off a yeah, lot on yeah, tangents. That's okay. but, but thank you for keeping us yeah. on task. Yeah. So I did a little digging and yeah. I found out that he wasn't really known as a tea drinker. Right. Mm -hmm. Not really known to drink too much, even for adult beverages. Right. Mm -hmm. He could have been a teetotaler. He could have been, but. But what wasn't? <laughs> But I don't know. I do know. Yeah. I, no, I don't think he was. No, right. <laughs> yeah. I have this little bit of information uh -oh, okay. that he was rather fond of a, of a wine, toke wine. Toke wine. And that is? It's a sweet wine from Hungary. Oh, okay. All right. And he liked to ha sip a little bit of that. Sure. Mm -hmm. He was introduced to that by William Randolph Hearst. Uh huh. So I guess he did many things. Wow. Including introducing Kelvin. Coolidge to Toke wine. Yeah. I don't know if you That's, see that much in history books. But. No, nor should you. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a drink, though, that was named in honor of Calvin Coolidge. Okay. It was called Keep Cool with Coolidge Highball. That's that's. That's interesting. <laughs> it is. And because this was, it was during one of his, his re-election. Right. And... That was during the time of Prohibition. Uh-huh. So it was non-alcoholic. Okay. 
Okay, so it goes back to the convention in 1924. Uh-huh. So the convention, the Republican convention was held in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh-huh. And it was, Calvin Coolidge was the, the their nominee. Right. But it was kind of not... It was not exciting. It was not exciting. Yeah. In fact, it was so boring yeah. that some of the delegates just took off yeah. and started doing other things. Uh-huh. Will Rogers, uh-huh. the, the famous humorist of the time, he right. even suggested that Cleveland should open up the churches to liven things up a bit. That's uh, that's a burn. <laughs> it is. So some folks here got creative. To, they wanted to create some excitement uh-huh. for Coolidge. Yes. So they had this Keep Cool with Coolidge highball, and uh-huh. it was made of raw eggs Mixed with fruit juice. They should have tried harder on the excitement part. <laughs> so it may be, you know that maple tea we had last yeah. week you weren't too fond of? Yeah. Maybe it, that maple tea in comparison sounds a little better? Eh, <laughs> jury is out. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So as we mentioned, we went to Plymouth Notch, childhood home of Calvin Coolidge, right. 30th president of the United States, uh-huh. and he was vice president mm-hmm. to Warren Harding. Uh-huh. And... This is our, we have this quest of uh-huh. going to presidential homes right. and libraries. Right. We're up to eight now. <laughs> wow. Ooh, still got, got some ground to cover. Okay, so he was Warren Harding's vice president. Uh-huh. and Who died in office. Who died in office. And in August 3rd of 1923, uh-huh. Calvin Coolidge was visiting his childhood home, right. Plymouth Notch, and he got word of Warren Harding's death. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's almost 101 years ago that today. Is. Yep. And in this area, this home, his father was a notary mm-hmm. and he administered the oath of office oh, okay. to Calvin Coolidge. Yeah. And so this uh, village is uh, uh, just an observation is, t- is tucked away. Right. Uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And. Um, you I, you know, and this is the, the 20s. I'm not sure what the communication, you know, situation was. Right. But uh, that was quite something, you know, to uh, to get word to him, you know, at this, what had to be a remote location back in the, it's still, which is still remote today. Uh, right, and, right. Uh, and it was a kind of an interesting uh, thing to happen. That's, a, that's an excellent point. The communications would have been, I mean, even yeah. when we had Pemberley Pines 20 years ago. Yeah. Very hard to get communication up there. <laughs> yes. Things have changed. We had to sh- shout loudly. <laughs> yes. So this Plymouth Notch is now, uh, it's in the same, uh, they restored it to right, the same right. yep, time yep. of Calvin Coolidge. Yep. And they've got stores and his right. homes. And and, tr- yeah, and a, a school yes. and a cheese factory. Cheese and, factory, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then upstairs of the village store mm-hmm. is a dance hall. Right. Which, when Calvin Coolidge was president, he turned that into a, uh, right. what they called the Summer White House. Uh-huh. That's where they conducted some of the business. Right. So, that, it's very interesting to see. It's it, yeah. Again, it's like a, a small Greenfield Village. It is, yes, mm-hmm. very much. So, and I think it's interesting because we did go to Warren G. Harding's home in April. Uh-huh. And learned all about him. Right. Got, got that cool mug. That I know. Had. I love it. And here... Just a few months later, we're we're in his successor. We're knocking them down. We are okay. So, Calvin Coolidge did not want to run again for president. Right. So it became Herbert Hoover. Mm-hmm. Yada yada yada. Mm-hmm. We all know uh, what followed after right. that. Right. But he was a uh, some of his things he was known for was strong support of women's suffrage. Uh-huh. He had a vague opposition to prohibition. Uh-huh. Maybe wanted some more Tokay wine. Uh-huh. And he also had to deal with the scandals of the Harding administration. Teapot Dome. Teapot Dome. Yep. That nice sounding scandal. <laughs> no. Okay. And so those are some of his, his politics. But I think what most of us know him for mm-hmm. is his nickname. Uh, Silent Cal. Silent Cal. Right. No. And by many counts, he got that name because he was on the quiet side. Uh-huh. A man of few words. That's right. And it said that he could be silent in five languages. <laughs> that's that's a thing. Yes. And there was one rumor that mm-hmm. went about that a, he was at a dinner mm-hmm. and the guest that was a dinner guest that was seated next to him right. turned to Calvin mm-hmm. 
Coolidge and said, I made a bet mm-hmm. that I can get you to say more than two words uh-huh. during the whole evening. Uh-huh. And he replied to her, you lose. That, that's amazing. Yeah, that said, <laughs> that silent uh-huh. wit uh-huh. That kind of creeps up on you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so he, he said, though, that that was not true. Mm-hmm. It was just a story, right. but it's kind of funny to yeah. share. So anyway... He is known for some famous quotes. And uh-huh. Chris, you're pretty good at yes. the quote challenge. I am. I am. Uh, so what do you think one of the quotes is a famous Calvin Coolidge quote? Uh, can, I, can I do it in Calvin Coolidge voice style? Oh, absolutely. All right. Here. <laughs> well, he's, he's uh, really famous for saying, uh, uh, Pepperidge Farm remembers that if it ain't broke, <laughs> don't fix it. Hey. <laughs> that is outstanding that's okay but it's wrong <laughs> it's it is wrong yep. and so what one of the quotes uh, he is known for is he said this mm-hmm. and i'm just going to do it in my own voice okay because yep. i can't replicate that nor should you <laughs> he said i have noticed that nothing i never said ever did any harm to that, me that's pretty good isn't it that's pretty yeah good. That, that's some wise yeah. wisdom yeah okay so, after all of that history uh-huh. that we were submerged in, yep. it was time to do some serious shopping. Some shopping therapy. Shopping therapy. Right. And we went to the Vermont Country Store. And it's, uh, it, it's literally the Vermont Country Store. I think there's two of them, actually. but uh, There is. Uh, but this was the main, the main one. This is the original one right, in right. Weston, New uh-huh. Weston. Vermont. Yeah. Population 600 or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. really small. Yeah. But, you know, it's in Vermont. That's yeah, right. So this is, I, I've known of the Vermont Country Store. I think most of us do from the catalog. Right. They uh, have the, like this unique product offering. Right. A lot of these old timey things, yeah. they have, they have Christmas ornaments mm-hmm. and obscure. Oh, just a lot of knickknacks cosmetics and things. And yeah. Knickknacks and, and they, uh, what else? Oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah. PJs, nightgowns, right. all these different things. And they also have old-timey toys, mm-hmm. lots of food, mm-hmm. and fudge. Yes. Okay, so the story of the Vermont Country Store mm-hmm. dates back to 1946 when Vrest, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh-huh. V-R-E-S-T. I, that's... Mm. Either a, a misspelling or that's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> so Vrest and his wife, Mary Ellen Orton, they opened up the Vermont Country Store in this village of Weston. Mm-hmm. And it was really inspired by childhood memories of his father's own general store. Okay. And he s- says that he could still recall being in his father's general store. Uh-huh. It was a little bit north of this area. Right. Where all the men came together mm-hmm. and they'd wait for the horse-drawn carriage that came from Montpelier Mm -hmm. to deliver the mail. Uh And he says, and I'm going to read this, Uh he said the store was warm and cozy. It smelled of leather harnesses, Mm -hmm. coffee, Mm -hmm. smoke kerosene lamps, Mm -hmm. tobacco, and sugar maple logs burning in the pot belly stove. Ah, I think uh, those are also listed on my tasting list. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I think you're right. I mean, we've had uh, some odd... Uh, descriptors in your flavor we I also know. i mean saying yeah. smoky kerosene lamp uh it's i think it's a thing i think it is or it oh, should be a thing it should be okay so it's still a family-run operation mm-hmm. it's in the fourth and fifth generation mm-hmm. and they are responsible for bringing back products that ha- were near extinction or just right. falling apart they they took some of these and they revived them mm-hmm. so there's this tangine lipstick right that became very popular uh-huh. and then went out they brought it back and they bought it mm-hmm. there's charles potato chips uh-huh they had those big tins uh-huh, there yeah, yeah and so they bring back these things that yeah. were popular went out of fashion yeah. came back and in, yeah. in demand yeah, it's a great it's a, a, a it's definitely a place to visit it is and but i don't think they have yet brought back the calvin coolidge highball mix uh. <laughs> That that's that's good. Get that's going out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably wise. Okay, 
So they uh, so they they really do have just the coolest things and yeah. and i i hope we get to go back there yeah, yeah. i've got a list of things i want to want to purchase because while we were there do you, do you remember what i bought well i think uh shopping therapy was followed by fudge <laughs> therapy right <laughs> that's right all, all those great things and i brought back fudge yeah. okay so really quick uh we from there the next day we went to vermont mm-hmm. teddy bear store uh-huh. where they sell those teddy bears and uh, if you're paranoid at all, you got all these beady little eyes staring you <laughs> all over the store. <laughs> yes, and I would love to get a Vermont teddy bear, but uh-huh. I don't know. I, I'm i getting some pressure to <laughs> we <laughs> eliminate have. some of my Muffy Vanda Bear. Yes, so. yeah. Okay, but they don't always, they also sell something else that isn't uh, of the teddy bear right, right. world. Right, right. Uh-huh. And they are the Vermont Mittens. Yes, and they were made famous by our same Bernie Sanders when he was uh, seated in a chair on a cold day out there for who knows what reason. The and, inauguration. And he's, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's wearing these these uh, great mittens. Right, right. So you can purchase yeah, these Vermont yeah. mittens, which yeah. I think would be great. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave Vermont for yes. a little bit because okay. I want to talk about Earl Grey. Uh-huh. You know, and that's one of those teas that I think we both really enjoy. Mm-hmm. It goes great with afternoon tea. Right. Kind of a lighter yeah. tea. It has that little citrusy right. notes that give uh, pair well with a lot of the afternoon tea fare. They do. Okay. So, there are some discrepancies in the origin stories of Earl Grey. What? I know. So, where it came from. I, I checked with uh, three different sources that I think are quite credible. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll share those with you. But first, I thought it'd be important to know who is Earl Grey. Yes. So Earl Grey. He was a real person. He was a real person. Yeah. And he was also known as Viscount Howick. Uh-huh. He was a distinguished distinguished British Whig politician. Uh-huh. And actually was Prime Minister of England in okay. the 1830s. Okay. So we know who this guy is. Right. And he lived in Howick Hall in Northumberland, England. Okay. So that's kind of Scot- Scotland adjacent. Oh, right, yeah, right. Okay. And uh, yes, very, very north. Mm-hmm. And his family had lived in this area dating back to the 1300s. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he made his, his homestead there, mm-hmm. a very nice Howick Hall. And guess what? We have not yet gone to this home. How could that have not happened? I know. I, I, I'm I going to put this on our list for when we go back. Right. Because guess what? They have a tea room there. Mm-hmm. And you know what it serves? I think Earl Grey. Earl Grey. Right. Exactly. Nice. <laughs> so that's on our next trip. Right. So what is the Earl Grey tea blend? Well, we, we've talked about that a little bit already, even in right. today's right, uh, right, right. podcast. It's a black tea with the oil of bergamot. Mm-hmm. Bergamot is a citrus, a small citrus fruit from the Mediterranean, right. like a small orange lemon. Right. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the the more popular stories mm-hmm. of the Earl Grey legend mm-hmm. dates back to this uh, to, of course, our Earl Grey uh-huh. and a Chinese mandarin mm. made this for him as sort of a, an honor as a right, gift right. and a mandarin at the time that was a chinese government official right kind of high ranking uh, one of the elite yes yeah. yes and that's what they were referred to in that time right there were mandarins right yeah. exactly so this was sort of uh kind of an ambassador thing right. and mm-hmm. and he it said that he made this blend for earl gray to go with the water mm-hmm. at his place in northumberland right it was very hard water, right. a lot of lime scale. Right. So he added this bergamot yep. in, uh, in it to yeah, counteract it, soften counter- it. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And then he liked it so much. Actually, his wife, Lady mm-hmm. Gray, mm-hmm. she liked it uh, as well. And when she entertained in London, right. she served it. Everybody loved it. So she wanted to see how they could make more of this tea so other people could purchase it. Right. And went to Twinings, and they made this Earl Grey blend. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But the the Greys were not terribly business savvy. 
Uh-oh. And yep. yes, they they didn't put any trademark on it, so they never got any royalties uh-huh. from all this Earl Grey that's out there. Wow. I know. So all of that information comes from the Tea Room website at How a Call. Okay. So you got to yeah. kind of take that yeah. with um, yeah. uh, perhaps a grain of salt or a little bit of bergamot. All right. Anyway, the next source is James Norwood Pratt, mm-hmm. great tea guru, author, and educator. Right. And we met him. Yes, it was on an escalator at a tea convention of all places, and what a great guy. Oh, he was. Yeah. I, I turned around, and yeah. I was dumbstruck. I yeah. was starstruck, I yeah. should say. I could barely speak. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> anyway, he was so gracious, and he took us back mm-hmm. to his his area right. at the tea convention, yeah. and we got to talk. Anyway, super good, super good guy, yeah. very t- knowledgeable. In his book, yeah. which I think I brought, oh, yes, here it is, the you see that? Yeah. It's the new Tea Lover's Treasury. This is a, a, an older version. But he also cites that story right. of the, the Chinese Mandarin. But he doesn't really eh, yeah. think it's... He's not convinced of right. the authenticity. Right. But he does mention that there was some controversy over who actually made the first blend of Earl Grey. Okay. Twinings, we heard about. Right. But also, Jackson's of Piccadilly uh-huh. said... They were the first ones. Wow. I know. <laughs> so this went on for decades. Yes. And it really became moot in 1990 because Twinings purchased this company. And they got to set the narrative. They as... did. <laughs> so it, I think it goes that Twinings is the right. creator. And then finally to Bruce Richardson. Right. Also a, a good friend of ours. Right. Writes Tea Time Magazine for Tea Time Magazine, also Elmwood in Teas, yep. that's his company. Right. He wrote in his blog, which is the Tea Maestro, mm-hmm. that there's no evidence, really, any written ev- evidence of any of these stories. Right. So he thinks it could really be just clever marketing in order to yep. tie this great family mm-hmm. to this kind of exotic blend. Well, it shows you what a, what a good PR camp- pan- campaign can do for you for like one drink, and then you've got that uh calvin coolidge concoction that didn't go anywhere because it wasn't <laughs> really you know wasn't I, marketed right very well right. plus it probably was awful <laughs> you know that's i was gonna say i mean tartanery yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of a cool product yeah. and right, other right. other things we've talked about right but the the <laughs> the calvin coolidge drink yeah yeah i don't think i think you could be the most clever marketing person ever uh-huh and it would still sit on the shelves uh probably okay so, okay, I think we have. We're getting to the end here. Getting to the end. So. All right. Do I hear that sound? You do. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Chris. All right. For all your great commentary. And thank On TV Studios for mm-hmm. allowing us to be here. All right. And to all our listeners and watchers. We're good. Please stay tuned. All right. We're done.